All right, we're going to get started. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming out. How's everyone doing tonight? Excellent. Uh, my name is Jason. I'm from uh, Jacobin Magazine. This is a co-production, as are the entire series of Jacobin Books with Verso Books. So first of all, we just wanted to open by saying thank you to Verso Books for publishing this series. Obviously, this is a beautiful space that we're being hosted in. And uh, we're we've been really grateful at Jacobin to work with the people at Verso to put these books out to get them into wider and wider layers of people. So thank you. Thank you to Verso. Uh, we just want to get a little bit of housekeeping out of the way, and then uh, I'll say a few words about why we're really excited about tonight's program, and then we'll get out of the way and, and, and start as quickly as we can. First of all, uh, as you may have noticed when you walk in, there are two piles of uh, Jacobin magazines. People should feel free to take copies uh, on their way in or on their way out. If you know some people at work or uh, where you live that could use a copy, then take one for them too. We want to make sure that we spread spread ideas uh, far and wide. Um, Verso Books has uh, a, an array of things for sale. So the, all Verso Books are 40% off at the table. And the Jacobin Books are all $10. So it's a, it's a great deal tonight. People should make sure to get Four Futures and all the other titles. Uh, they take cash or credit there. And they also take cash or credit at the bar. We're serving wine and beer tonight. So people should help themselves throughout the event and then stick around and talk about some of the, the politics that we discussed tonight or, or whatever's on their mind uh, with other people. Uh, next Wednesday. Is gonna, there's going to be an event here uh, for another Verso author. Richard Seymour is coming in from Great Britain to talk about uh, Jeremy Corbyn. He just wrote a book about that and everything that's going on uh, with momentum, with the sort of and the, the sort of changing tide in, within labor. Uh, that's going to be an event that's hosted and moderated by Bhaskar Sankara. So that should be an excellent discussion. Hopefully, people will check that out as well. Uh, and then. That, that's it for housekeeping. I just wanted to say a quick word about why we are so excited to publish for futures. First of all, Peter Frey has been a longtime writer for Jacobin. There was a fantastic article in the very first issue that hooked me on Jacobin uh, for good. Since then, he's written a, a number of articles that have just built a, a, hu a huge following. This particular work is, is really exciting and builds on some of the, ar the articles that have been most popular and most influential. Uh, we're very excited that in a moment right now, which is so dominated by the, the presidential election, and just sort of like a total absence of vision for what could happen, both sort of in the negative and in the positive, there's just sort of nothing but election, to be able to put out something that actually makes has ideas about what could be happening and, and, and takes as a starting point what's actually happening in the world, which is the scarcity caused by environmental destruction and the uh, abundance created by automation, et cetera. And so to take these very real dynamics that people are experiencing and, and to project into the future what we could be dealing with, I think is, ex is enormously exciting. i um, really excited that Peter wrote the book. I think everybody's going to really enjoy the discussion, and they should make sure they check out the book. Um, we were trying to figure out who a good interlocutor would be and you know Alyssa was a it was an early choice just because of the work that she's done in Jacobin she's written a number of articles about a range of questions the environmental movement needs to take up and about uh, creating a left environmental movement that can really actually meet the challenges that are posed by today's environmental crisis so given those sorts of areas we think we can have a very exciting discussion tonight we're going to hear from the two of them and then uh, Alyssa's going to uh, open up things for for Q&A so people should save questions uh, until after that and then we'll have plenty of time after that to uh, to get the book to talk about to, to everybody else and to, and to hang out. So thanks, everybody, for coming out. And without any further ado, we'll kick it over to the event. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone, for coming out. Um, I am very excited to be here um, and excited to see such a great crowd for this. Um, probably like many people here, I read uh, Peter's initial essay um, not like five years ago, I guess, and uh, was really struck by it and have continued to think about it and return to it since. Um, and so it's really exciting to see this uh, a more fleshed out and richer version of it that um, I think is really doing. Um, I was struck as I was reading by how much I think uh, Peter and I have been thinking about similar questions and like reading, I was like noticing all these things that I've been reading and trying to figure out what to do with. Um, and it was really fantastic to have this um, really terrific synthesis of and an analysis and such a clear sort of um, uh, 
such a clear uh, diagram of the, these sorts of different um, visions of both utopia and dystopia. And it's, I think, particularly interesting, this question um, uh, of, of uh, I mean, as, as Peter will explain in a minute, I think there's the, the, the question of the two socialisms and the two barbarisms. But um, I think, uh, you know, for a while it seemed like there weren't many visions of utopia. And now I think we have, we're, we're starting to see a real um, explosion of, of utopian um, thinking on the left, which is really exciting. I mean, if you know, go over to the books table. There's like, uh, there's there's a bunch of them over there, including Thomas More's original. Um, but so I think, uh, you know, um, there's been a real a real surge in sort of utopian thinking. But of course, also um, uh, uh, a fair number of dystopias, probably particularly in the sort of apocalyptic vein of, of pop culture. Um, but so I think it's uh, it's a really um, useful tool to sort of uh, to try to parse a little bit at what's going on with those um, and have a, a guide to, to thinking through these different these different visions of, of what it could be. So um, I before we get into sort of the discussion, Peter is going to to do a, a quick sort of um, layout of what this of the framework of the book because um, it's you know I think again one of its real contributions is this really nice structure that gives us a way to think about um, the possibilities in front of us and then we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, how we can think about those, and maybe how we can even get to one of them. <laughs> All right, yeah, thank you, uh, Alyssa. Yeah, I'll try, I'll try to do this quickly, because it is a very, there's a sort of rigid structure to the book that I want to walk through. Use the mic, Peter. All right, I want to stand up, but I'll try to use the mic. Um, all right, um, so the starting point of this is, well, some people, some people, have asked, some people have asked me, like, where did this book come from? And I said it came from reading a lot of Karl Marx and a lot of science fiction. Uh, the ideas in it are not necessarily new, but they're maybe presented in a slightly different way. And the starting point is something that has become more current in our popular discussion yet again of late, which is automation, robotization, algorithms. Are the robots coming to take our jobs? You've probably all seen the mainstream press and even the left press, you know, among people like Paul Mason and others talking about this question. Are we going to automate all human labor? And, you know, I, I grew up on the Marxist dream of eliminating the need for human labor and also the Star Trek dream of eliminating the need for human labor where we have replicators, we have sources of free energy, and we can transcend send the, the need for us to engage in drudgery, essentially. That is my, you know, my utopian vision, both my Marxist and my science fiction vision. And so this book started from the question of, well, how do we think about that possible future and how do we think about it in a political way? Because the problem with a lot of these, a lot of what you see now, a lot of the books that come out, a lot of the magazine articles that come out is that they they sort of presuppose that there's no politics, that the technology happens like this and then the social development happens like that and we are just inevitably going into either the good future or the bad future. It's either the good future where the machines liberate us from all labor or the bad future where we all have no jobs and we starve. Uh, I wanted to put the politics back into that vision, but I wanted to start from that premise. What if we could automate? What if we could where we had the possibility of that post-work utopia. And that's where the sort of the two-by-two two structure that animates this book came from. And it has, it says, okay, suppose we could do that. Suppose we could automate everything. What are the other questions that have to be dealt with? And there's two axes. There's two parameters that have to be dealt with. So there's... If this will work, yeah, this is a this is a, an ex excellent example of the complica complexities of a, of techno utopianism. Then uh, I can't actually get it to do what I want it to do. Uh, ah, here we go. All right. Sorry. All right. So we have one axis. What I call the axis of ecology. This is. I had to be sort of in, encouraged to recognize the importance of this, but the more, like, as, over the years as I've worked on this project, it's become more and more central to me. This is the question of even if human labor is not necessary, what about climate change? What about resource scarcity? Water? You know, farmable land? Places to live? Uh, do we live in this world of scarcity? Do we live in this world where 
our political project has to be very much centered on this question of who gets what and how do we allocate it? Or do we live in the truly abundant world where we're not just post-work but we are really post-scarcity, where we find a way to transition to renewable energy, to clean up the environment, to deal with climate change, all of that stuff, to really get to the Star Trek world. So that's one axis. But the other axis, and I think the one that's the most important, is, the, is what I just call the class struggle axis. This is the politics of it, and this is what gets left out so much of the time. And it's this question of do we live in a world of equality? Which, you know, I, when I, I was just doing a lot of talks around uh, England and Scotland where I would ask people, what do they think, of, what does socialism mean to you? People who call themselves socialists, and a lot of them would say to me, well, you know, equality and fairness is just fundamental to it, and, and I do think it's fundamental to it. And so it's, do we live in that world? Do we live in a world where however much abundance or scarcity we have, do we live in a world where that's, you know, where, where that's shared out equally, or do we live in the world we have now, which is the world of hierarchy, the world of ruling classes and subordinate classes, right? So this is the two-by-two two grid. This is what produces the four futures, which are all, they're thought experiments. They're ideal types, to use Max Weber's phrase. They're intended to do two things. First, to identify things going on in the present that I think are politically salient to the left, and then to sort of extrapolate forward what would it look like if we think forward into a society where this is the main question. So we start in the, the top right corner, equality and abundance, which I call communism in Marx's sense of from each according to their ability to each according to his need. We can hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, write criticism after dinner. Uh, we, and I, you know, there are a lot of people who write about elements of sort of communistic forms of life that exist now, whether it's your local community garden or whether it's Wikipedia. And so I talk about that in this chapter, but I also talk about what are the limits and the contradictions of those forms. What, what are the problems in a communist society? And, you know, I, I refer to my friend, the political scientist, Corey Robin, who likes to say that socialism, or in this case, communism, is the, pro is the project of transforming hysterical misery into ordinary unhappiness. And there is much unhappiness. There are status hierarchies. There are, you know, there is still racism. There is still sexism, potentially. There are still, you know, you, can, you look at things like Wikipedia. You look at these sort of projects. They are not sort of, they're not perfect. But if you can separate all those things from the master hierarchy of capitalism, it becomes much more tractable. It becomes much more easy to think about what those, uh, about how to make those uh, truly utopian worlds. Now, so that's the easy part, right? That's the, that's the good part. But then what if, the, where this whole project actually started was when I was trying to think about, well, you know, the Star Trek universe, the Star Trek world, replicators, free energy, all that stuff. What if you had that but you still had a class society? What would that even look like? Does that even make any sense? And that led me to this concept of a society I called rentism, in which the structuring property form is intellectual property for the most part. It's patents, it's copyrights, it's you can make anything you want with your replicator but you have to pay a licensing fee for it. And it is in fact the case that more and more of especially rich country economies but not just rich country economies are made up of the value that is based in intellectual property. Not Right, that are that are rents, and so rent traditionally it's like rent on land. You own a piece of land, you can give someone the right to access it. You don't make anything, you don't do anything. You just control the property, and therefore they have to give you money. But intellectual property has the same form. You, it take, costs nothing to copy, you know, a digital file of a movie, uh, but it's illegal to do so unless you pay the licensing fee to the person who owns it. Likewise, it costs almost nothing to make many life-saving drugs, but the pharmaceutical companies that own the rights to those drugs charge enormous sums, even in poor countries where people cannot really afford it, again, because they, they are able to sort of squat that, that pattern. The ability to copy that pattern is something that is legally protected, and so that, that future, the second future, is one that is based on the idea of, you know, what if that becomes essentially the whole, the whole of the economy, or almost the whole econ of the economy, and what are the contradictions of that? So that's the, that's the sort of 
And that's in some ways the easy question, but I, in some ways I think the interesting question because it's, it presupposes you know, true ecological abundance. But if we are really putting the ecological contradiction front and foremost, then we're talking about where I actually use the term socialism. I call myself a socialist in general, but socialism to me is about economic democracy and economic planning. But this is about not economic planning the way it was in the 20th century where we were talking about planning production, but economic planning in terms of planning consumption, in terms of planning if we, if the Earth can only support so much, if we have the Star Trek replicators but we only have so many inputs to them, how do we decide who, how we share that out equally? And that's where I talk about like what does ecology look like in this context? What does, what do the debates about economic planning in the 20th century have to tell us um, about that? And I take a sort of, I guess a sort of a modernist approach to ecology and saying that like this is a world in which we don't withdraw from nature but become ever more involved in it, in planning it. That planning involves not just planning the human economy but planning nature in some sense. Finally, I have to get to the last part, the last square. I never know if this is where I should end up or if I should do this in a different order because the dis it's so dystopian and I, one of my first reviewers of this book found, called it sort of hysterical, like something like your kind of crazy friends post on Facebook, and it sort of is. But if you have a society of scarcity, and you also have a society of hierarchy, so in, if you have pure abundance, you have a society in which it's sensible for the rich to basically have this sort of Potemkin capitalism where you, people have to, you know, pay licensing fees for intellectual property and all this nonsense. But that only works if the rich don't have to actually give up some of their standard of living. In a society in which there is real scarcity that really binds the ruling class, you have this problem. And I get at this, I get at this fundamental thing that socialists have always talked about, which is traditionally we've always said there's this relationship of mutual dependence, interdependence between the capitalist class and the working class. The capitalist class needs the workers to run the factories, to run the shops. But the working class needs the capitalist class because they don't have any other way of making money. But if you can automate everything, then the working class, then the ruling class doesn't need us anymore. So then what? They have their robots, they have their gated communities, they have their private islands, they have what I call the regime of exterminism which I stole the word from E.P. Thompson. He was talking about nuclear war, but, and it's so disturbing that I can't even make it stay on the screen. Um, but yes, you have. <laughs> you have, have a regime in which essentially the logic is to exterminate what is regarded as a surplus population, and today those might be people in refugee camps. They might be people that are dying of preventable diseases. They may be people that are dying of, from natural disasters that are caused by climate change. So it doesn't have to be like a cartoon genocide. There are ways in which the surplus populations are eliminated and the rich convince themselves that it's not their fault. But that is the logic of the fourth future. And yes, it is in some ways the hysterical future, but it's sort of necessary to complete the picture. And I probably talked much longer than I intended to, so I'll stop here and let Alyssa go wherever she wants to go. Um, thank you for laying that out. I was wondering where you're going with the costume change, uh, but uh, that was an impressive reveal, so. Um, Sadly, I don't have as many layers on as Peter, so I will not be taking things off. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think there, there are so many things I want to talk about um, in this book. Um, but I guess, so starting with uh, the sort of, as, as you say, you sort of start the book by saying these two specters are haunting Earth, is the specter of ecological catastrophe and automation. And um, as you were sort of narrating this, I think it's, it's interesting to, um, I think it's it, it seems clear to me the ways that that um, 
that you're thinking actually starts from the, the, the concern about automation and sort of moves towards thinking about, I guess, um, ecological catastrophe. I mean, I think that really, you know, the sort of concern about automation in the future of work is really animating, um, is really animating this, this diagram. And it's interesting, the sort of, um, I guess, just the, as you say, you're sort of, you have to take a, a, a modern approach to, to ecology, which I am generally sympathetic to, but it's, it's interesting that the sort of usual, the usual, like, diagram of, of some sort of eco-utopia, dystopia, tends to be the sort of Arcadia, back to nature kind of thing versus like the modernist future, which can either be, you know, people see either as like a, you know, kind of wonderful future or virtually dystopian. And so um, you, you just take the tack, nope, we're just going full on to utopia and, and the sort of via the automated route. Um, interesting, you know, in some ways, the. Um, the, the sort of Marxist or like Marxist sort of communist future is, is in some ways I think a kind of Arcadian one or like a very you know it's like romantic in its own way capital R um, but uh, but I think you know but I generally um, agree with you that the sort of I guess like the you know modernist approach is, is the right one and um, and the sort of question there seems to be I guess like if, if the if the main um, concern is uh, this this um, the future of what happens when we have um, labor automated away, or we, that we, the desire is to automate away all sort of drudgery and, and um, unpleasant work and all of these things. Um, I mean, not to sort of get too uh, like pedantic or something, but I do think that there is a real question of like of what is work and how do we define it and 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 is it all automatable? And I think you, you do lay out a nice tripartite sort of thing. There's paid labor and there's socially necessary labor and there's sort of meaningful work um, and these things. But I think. Um, one of the things that I, I, I like, you know, kind of kept wondering throughout was um, what to do. Um, and I think you see this most, most often in the sort of Marxist feminist debates over social reproduction and so on. But um, you know, automation may be all well and good for for making stuff in a factory or replicating, um, you know, like some kinds of like goods or material stuff or whatever. But what do we do when it's when it's the sort of um, the kinds of whether um, whether it's care work or other kinds of social reproduction and things that I think actually will be probably pretty important in the in the you know like whatever kind of uh, the future where we avoid ecological catastrophe. So um, what's I guess like the sort of um, I'm not sure what the question exactly is or like what. Um, what should we do with these sort of like nebulous kinds of work? I also kind of ended up sketching out my own other like little. I, mean, I was like, this this got me. Oh, sorry. Um, this got me thinking very, uh, you know, kind of in this like diagrammatically. So I have draw, like drawing all these little different diagrams. So I have a diagram that I might that I might propose in a minute. But first, um, yeah, what should we do with this question of what what is work and, and should we automate it all away? Like, if, is that is that the the goal that we should hold up? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very complicated question that I can't fully answer, but I, my starting point tends to be that what we need is a politicization of the concept of work. So I, you know, I write uh, often and I talk about things like the basic income, reducing working hours, the robust welfare state, things that give people the ability to say no to different kinds of work. And this, you know, and this in terms of the, the feminist conversation, you can go back to the, you know, wages for housework and Selma James and Mary de la Costa and this sort of often misunderstood politics, I think, that was precisely attempting to identify a form of work so that it could be refused. Used. And it's when work can be refused, whether it's the unpaid work that women often do or whether it's various kinds of low-wage labor, it's when the work can be refused that then it becomes politicized. Then you have to ask the question of who does this work and why. So, you know, I've in the context of things like you know, basic income, I've said, well, if you you know you you create a situation where people can opt out of work and then some jobs, maybe nobody wants to take that. Who wants to work the night shift at 7-Eleven? Who wants to clean the toilets? And then the question becomes, well, can you automate that work? Or does it actually, does that job just not need to exist? Or do we have to actually have a conversation about who does it? Because now we are in a situation where 
that question, who does that work, is answered by either who is the least powerful in the labor market or who feels socially obligated to do it in the case of a lot of the work that women do. And so it's bringing that stuff out into the light and politicizing it. And yes, in, I, in general, you know, I think I'm, I'm sort of a maximalist in terms of what I think can be automated. Even a lot of what people talk about is care work. Look, I'm I'm happy to have a cute robot take care of me when I'm dying, and you know, and I'm an old geezer. I'm fine with that. I do not need a human being to do that. Um, but but there there is this question of are there certain things that are just fundamentally about you know, as I say in the book, how we are how we take care of one another that are fundamentally like things that you know we don't want to get rid of because they're fundamental to what we think of as being human. But again, it's that's those are things that I want to bring into the light and make political rather than sort of being, you know, being sort of like under the radar and being concealed in terms of like how that division of labor is created and how it is decided who does it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, this is working. Um, I, I completely agree with that as a goal. I think it's you know incredibly important to be to politicizing what and I guess work and, and asking sort of what what work is and, and who's doing it. And I um, was sort of thinking about, um, I guess in the, um, I, I guess maybe I'm a little more skeptical about the sort of ability to, you know, to, to automate all the sorts of forms of, of care work and things. and. Um, you know, to, to have the cute robot or whatever, um, which may work for some things, but, but probably um, I think in some ways maybe uh, that is, I think, one of the, the more, seems like one of the more challenging places. And, and um, I guess um, on, the, on the one hand, it seems like um, I, I agree with your sort of, you know, um, this, this point you make that like when we, um, we should remove that from wage labor, and we can then actually kind of care for each other, and so on. Um, but I, you know, I keep coming back to this question of like, what do we? How do we? Um, I guess if if there's some concern about equality or, or scarcity, how do you how do you actually distribute some amount of of things like care and these these things that um, you know used to be managed by the family, and then if you if you're not doing it through the the market, or I guess you know sort of like a a, a mandated care in some way. Um, what what we do when um, these sorts of institutions that used to um, again sort of like provide this um, outside of the realm of wage labor, um, how do we replace? You know, how do you replace that if you if it's not as easily sent to a robot? Um, and I was sort of you know thinking about the tradition of of um, interesting like feminist science fiction that's sort of playing with, um, I don't know, like abolishing gender, like multi-gender stuff and, um, and all of these things. It's like about trying to get beyond a, a gender division of labor in some ways, but I, but I also think that most of that doesn't do as much with the kind of, um, kind of questions of like production and the economy. And so I was, I was thinking, well, I don't, I don't know if it's worth drawing out my, my little thing, but I think there's a sort of, um, in terms of the question of work, it seems as a sort of like an anti-work politics, or the question of the politics of work. This was sort of like pro-work politics, or not pro-work politics, but like we have to do it, and so we should just recognize it or valorize it in some way, and that's some of what we associate with traditional Marxist labor politics. Um, that's, you know, kind of the dignity of work and so on, which I think you do like a really nice job of, um, you know, critiquing and dispelling and, you know, pointing out that for Marx, like labor is not actually kind of the, you know, the, what we should aspire to as, as the ultimate end of human existence. But, um, but there's still, you know, a tradition of that or a sort of at least sort of we should all just, um, you know, maybe sometimes rather than the, the basic income, the job guarantee that everyone just gets a job and that's, that's the way to deal with it. Um, and then the, the anti-work politics, which I think, um, you know, you are, I think, one of the really interesting writers in. Um, and then there's a, I guess, the what is work, and there's the everything and the kind of nothing, <laughs> um, or the, like a, a tendency towards like calling everything work, or everything is like a kind of labor, um, which um, uh, I think, again, sort of like makes the automation question quite, um, tricky, um, and then the, the nothing is, um, or not nothing, but there's like a sort of very clearly defined space of like work, production, labor, and um, and it seems like what you end up doing um, around this question of the politics of work ends up going in really different directions based on, um, or there, there's some like mirror visions. I was just reading also, um, 
the um, Frederick Jameson's new book on you know the arm, the Universal Army, which is sort of this like I think in many ways feels like a mirror image or not mirror image, but like a, the reverse of, of your vision in many ways. Where it's like um, we'll put um, rather than kind of automating away work, we we make everyone do work through the army or something. So sorry not to go off into another book, um, but uh, that was that was just sort of one of the the the, the sort of um, how to handle this question of of. Um, necessary labor, whether we can get rid of it or should just distribute it amongst amongst ourselves. Um. I mean, to me, there's. I mean, there are a lot of very complicated questions here, but there is some. There's a thing that happens in these conversations often that I think is like it makes things more complicated, seem more complicated than they actually are, because there's a fundamental thing when I look at these questions of work. What is work? What is not work? What do you know? How do we think about work? It's okay. It's do you have to make people do it? Or would they would they do it like if we could separate it from the question of I need a roof over my head, I need food, I need money, would people just do it? You know, I know a lot of people who you know you know are grad students who love to teach, uh, who love to do research, uh, and they at this point basically do do it almost for free given the nature of the system that we that we now have, uh, and would continue to do it if they could have their health care and their you know their living standards provided for. And so to me, there's that thing, and then there's the thing of okay, yeah, who cleans the toilets and that sort of thing, and that's where I'm like, yes, either it's automated or we have to like have a political discussion about who does it things that nobody wants to do. That's, it's like, it doesn't, to me, have to be that much more complicated than that. And yes, there's emotional labor and there's effective labor and things where it becomes, but again, it becomes this question of who's doing what and how do we politicize that and how do we draw into the open what work is being done and by whom. Where, but again, it's like, do yeah, is this something you want to do, or is this something you're being forced to do? It's like it's sort of a fundamental question. It's like freedom and emancipation, which is to me at the core of like the Marxist critique of labor, is where I come back to on all of this stuff. Yeah. Um, well, maybe this is a good time to lay my cards on the table by saying that I am one of said grad students who is both, uh, but I think both doing the things that I would want to do. I feel like actually I was thinking about this, and it's like both sometimes feels like the the realization of the you know. Um, or in the moments when you when you aren't teaching or something, it's the you know realization of the the UBI sort of uh, dream where you can you can read and write and do what you want. Um, but it's also um, you know also we are like you know I. Uh, um, Trying to, I think, you know, in the like, I am currently in the midst of a uh, um, a union fight at, about defining, you know, the work that people like graduates and do as work too. So it's like actually feels like both poles of that come through in this this one example. Um, so um, you know, maybe that's just my bio, biographical read, but I think it's it does it does feel sometimes hard to parse like the um, or um, the you know. I do think that um, maybe maybe it is complicating things more than you need to be, but it does seem like there's like quite different politics that comes out whether you define something as work and are saying sort of like this is recognized this is work or or this is like my yeah. um, my leisure time and should be sort of. Um, and that, that's certainly true. I mean, it's but that's also part of why I like I'm very big on the politics and the sort of the ideology of separating income and sort of our basic standards of living from work. Like it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter what you're doing. Like, you don't have to justify yourself as a worker or as a human being in order to deserve a basic standard of living in a rich society, right? I think that's a really important principle of that. Yeah, I mean, I understand strategically that often you say, like, yeah, workers organizing as workers, like, is still a thing. Like, the traditional labor movement has not gone away, uh, and it, it's, that's still an important political struggle. But I... When I'm in my sort of more speculative and mode, um, I want to make this like hammer that point. It's like we all deserve a base, you know, to be able to live decent lives. Uh, we live in a society that can provide that, and the only reason that it doesn't is because of uh, the capitalist elite that is in charge of things, right? And that that has nothing to do with what we do or don't do as work. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with the sort of um, the aim of um, of this sort of you know divorcing dessert and production, or saying you know you, it's not um, that that shouldn't be the way that um, you get to live a good life or any life at all. Um, 
And I guess, sorry, I, you know, I, I don't mean to be harpy on the question, and I won't. I, we can move on. Um, I, I guess I just want to say the reason I, that I have been thinking about this so much is I do think it's um, the question of, of what kinds of, um, I guess, like what what kinds of like work or or, or activity or whatever uh, some kind of ecologically viable socialist utopia would require seems um, to, to it seems like quite important to figure out what um, what kinds of things that we would need to do and, and it really does seem to me that um, again sort of like the the activities of social and ecological reproduction are like quite central to that um, and figuring out how to, to manage like that form of production as well as um, the sort of more traditional kinds seem um, seems like a, a major challenge really um, but so you know but so I don't, don't want to kind of um, keep harping on it um, I guess um, the sort of uh, the this um, the question of um, well I guess so I um, I guess some of this goes to the point of um, what it seems like each of you know the, the your sort of different futures, the four futures um, would would entail a very different sort of way of um, both you know I think both a different sort of strategic orientation or way of thinking about like what kinds of politics or, or whatever we would need as well as probably like a quite different way of thinking about technology or like which you know probably we don't want the same machines in every future um, or like certain machines are like good for for certain features more than others um, and like there is like a politics and the technologies and so on but so I guess um, thinking about like how um, this, this sort of, I guess, politics of the current moment. Um, you know, I guess I'm curious, like, which which future you think is like uh, maybe ought to be our, our like the point we're aiming for. I was thinking about um, so Robert uh, Robert Heinlein, the, um, the science fiction author who wrote the sort of uh, fantastically titled "The Moon is a Harsh Mistress," from which we which popularized the phrase "No such thing as a free lunch." Had these three categories of sci-fi, which are like if only sci-fi, um, what if sci-fi, and if things go on as they are sci-fi. And these are the sort of like ways that you can think about. Um, the different uh, different kind of categories of, of thinking about the future and um, or thinking about like what what science fiction is doing and I sort of was thinking about this in relation to your categories and I felt like um, if this goes on as maybe rentism or exterminism it feels like actually that's sort of the um, some like extension of, of the present and actually felt I was I was a little curious actually what you would say about the um, uh, or whether you consider this to be post-capitalist, because you know the sort of the yeah. premise being that they're like the four, the four yeah. features are all out. What happens after capitalism? They yeah, like I they mean, could continue. Right, and yeah, and I didn't say it when I was sort of pitch, giving the initial pitch, but yeah, I mean, I start with the Rosa Luxemburg formulation. You know, we have a choice between socialism and barbarism, and this is just an elaboration of that. I got view two socialisms and two barbarisms, but it's the same concept. So they're all post-capitalist to me in some sense. The premise is that this what we think of as capitalism has to turn into something else, at least if we accept you know, the premise that I use in the book about widespread automation, but that, that, doesn't, that something else doesn't have to be emancipatory. Um, you know, it's, and I've been, I've been asked a million times, you know, as I've been talking about this book, like, which one, where, which direction do you think we're really going? Where are we, you know, where, what's, which one would you predict? And, you know, I, I sort of belabor this point that I don't, I'm not a futurist. I don't, I don't want to say this is where we're going in 20 years. This is like my matrix of possibilities of this is what I can see based on my own sort of like theoretical like understanding of the contradictions of capitalism as it exists right now. Um, and yes, in another sense, all of these things are happening right now, and all of the you know this is all like all science fiction. It's a story about the present, not about the future. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's not really an answer to the question, but I don't I don't, I don't know how else to. 
Well, I'm happy to make proclamations that may um, may turn out to be uh, faulty. Um, I mean, I was I, I do think that the sort of communism to me seemed to be the the if only version. The you know kind of the um, wouldn't it be great? I, I tried to make it seem as like uncool as possible because it's like people are like, well, it's communism. It's the end of history. It's awesome. Everything's great. I'm like, no, oh, it's like if, imagine if like everything was like a Wikipedia edit war. Oh right, yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> which is not cool. I mean, it's better than what we have now, but it's not that awesome. Um. I found it pretty good. I don't know. <laughs> um, but, you know, so, yes, we'll still have Wikipedia edit wars, but we'll also have, you know, sort of uh, super abundance and, and right. you know, quality and all that. Right. The challenge know, so in that chapter was to, like, make it seem like a real place, like, and not just, like, a, you know, fairies and rainbows kind of, like, silly, you know, uh, confection. Because I, because in some ways I do think like again, like I was saying, like I want new, more better problems than the problems we have under capitalism, and that's what communism is to me. It's better problems. <laughs> that's a, it's a good slogan. <laughs> better problems, not cool. Better problems. That's what we're fighting for. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, um, no, I, I think, I think you do, um, you do do a nice job of sort of um, pointing out that like this is not, you know, you sort of this is sort of Corey Robin's point that it's, you know, it's just sort of uh, will still be unhappy but not like desperately miserable, um, or there will be like there will be problems and challenges. It's not sort of waving the magic wand and making everything bad go away. Um, but there's still, you know, an element of um, of a bit of, you know, I think the. Um, that uh, that that most of the sort of major problems are solved, or you know, sort of that you know, um, scarcity or material limits, or, or like kind of materiality in many ways are, are waved away. Or bit. well, I mean, it's not even materiality necessarily. It's the it's capitalism as a symbolic structure that organizes everything. So the metaphor I use in that chapter is of capitalism as a magnet. You know, it's like got capital on one end and labor on the other, and it's a magnetic field that draws all under other conflicts into. It's into its magnetic field. So it's not to say that all other social hierarchies and conflicts are reducible to capitalism, racism, sexism, other kinds of status hierarchies. You know, they're not reducible to the capital relation, but that, that big magnet, that draws everything into its field. And so, yeah, everything ultimately comes down to, is this going to affect my ability to make a living, to survive? And so when you break that relation, when you, when you sort of shatter the world of status hierarchies into, you know, into sort of what the, you know, the post, you know, I once, you know, one of my intellectual influences, Moish Pastan once described postmodernism as premature post-capitalism, this idea that like postmodern identities and this sort of fracturing of, you know, of identities into like a million pieces was like, yeah, that's like maybe what it would be like in a post-capitalist society. We're not there yet, but that's maybe what it would be like. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then there's the sort of, I guess, um, I guess socialism, as you describe it, seems to be, um, or my reading of socialism, as you describe it, is, is it, that feels to me like the most what if is like the one that feels the most possible, I guess, or the sort of most like, um, the, the so I guess, uh, if you don't want to choose a future, I will. I will happily choose yeah. one. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, when people ask me that question, I do always sort of say, since I started writing the book, like, they every time, every day, something comes out about climate change, and I'm like, oh god, <laughs> like we're going to be dealing with this for a while. Like, yeah. I still want communism in the long run, but yes, the socialist problematic of how do we manage scarcity is yes going to be the short run, and by short run, I mean like the next hundred years problem. History will, you know, weigh upon us um, like a nightmare. Um, uh, so, I mean, yeah, I think I guess I, I usually come down on this, um, or you know, I think have have. I guess um, would consider um, most of you know the, I guess sort of the politics or orientation I have is, is the sort of socialism as you describe I think for this reason um, and uh, I um, I mean it, that it's it does seem sort of important to figure out in some way as like uh, as a vision of, of the left like what you know what we we want to aim for like maybe we have a, a, a what if um, 
uh, or an if only scenario, but um, you know, to 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 kind of act in the present, um, you know, requires some some vision of like the what if that seems that seems sort of possible and realizable. Um, I mean, I frankly do sometimes think that the that. Um, that much of the left in um, in the U.S. at least has, um, although you know, usually pro proclaiming itself socialist, um, not in in your sense particularly, has probably more an orientation towards um, uh, towards the the communism that you describe of sort of imagining a you know kind of. Um, <laughs> You know, not kind of. I think wanting to confront in many ways some like like ecological questions or something, or to 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 not um, that there's that there's the sort of the vision of superabundance um, continues to drive. I think a lot of of our thinking in um, in one way or another. Um, and I think in some ways it does rely on this like techno fix at the at the base of uh, you know the, the the Star Trek replicator and the you know the um, whatever its source of energy is. I, I have to admit I grew up watching Star Wars, not Star Trek. So which I then of course yeah, came it's to just realize hand waves is, uh, anyway. it's whatever <laughs> antimatter, dilithium crystal, no, something. No, or other, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think I, I admit this only out of my own sort of you know eventual realization that I had, I had watched the wrong um, ideologically wrong side. Science fiction growing up, but um, but uh, but you know, so I guess um, I don't know. I mean, the the question of of, of you know um, of, of which one we we picked does seem like fairly fairly significant in terms of, of political strategy and, and and thinking about this question of struggle and class struggle and like where that's located. And and I was thinking about actually where are like I was saying, I think there's like a lot of utopias and dystopias that have that have come out and um, I was curious about um, or there's there's all these visions of utopia and dystopia, but there's a lot less like science fiction about like um, the struggle to get there, and like a lot there's not a ton of science fiction of class struggle. And the only thing I thought about lately was, of course, Snowpiercer. Um, and I don't I don't know. Do you think Snowpiercer is like a, you know the I don't know as a, in the in the vein of science social fiction? What's your read? I mean, I, I like I actually wrote a review of Snowpiercer for Jacobin in which I essentially argued that it was a post work fable of a certain kind. Uh, that argued that anti-capitalism entails not just taking the engine, as the metaphor of that movie had it, but actually sort of smashing it and getting into a completely other way of living. And yeah, the there's also an ecological trope there. And I mean, you talked about sort of the... Uh, you know, the sort of the techno fix idea. To me, it's sort of, there's sort of, it's techno fix is all the way down in a certain sense for me. It's just what kind are we talking about? Yeah, the easy way out is to say, oh, we're just going to find a way, you know, climate change, we're going to fix it. We're going to get to renewable energy. We're going to do this. Or maybe we're going to upload our brains into machine or whatever, you know, stupid singularity crap or whatever. Um, but, you know, I, my argument in the chapter on socialism in the book where, that I make is sort of like, it's the deepest, most sort of technically sophisticated engagement with the relationship between human beings and nature it happens when we're taking very seriously how do we con make this a planet that we can continue to live on. Because, yes, I do think that dealing with you know, the way in which we have now modified this planet and we will therefore have to continue to modify it, I don't think we're going to another planet. I don't think we're uploading our brains into machines. I think that the you know the real politics going forward is figuring out the really complex project and the political project of how we continue to more deeply engage with the human project of modifying the natural environment. You know, again, it's sort of like I call that sort of the modernist perspective. And I think, yeah, I think there are certain kind of techno utopian leftists that want to just not think about that because they want to hand wave it away. And there's like a lot of greens that want to sort of say, well, this is bad because the problem is that human beings have mucked around with the natural environment and we need to somehow like withdraw from it. And yeah, I'm. And uh, I'm trying to push this idea that, like, yeah, this is this this is, this is like this is a very in a very deep way, like the political economy of socialism is about how do we how do we think about 
basically making making a managed nature, making all of the world into a you know into a national park essentially, in which you know like a park is not not wild nature. A park is something that is created to preserve a form of the world that we want to have for our human purposes, and that's increasingly the entire world. You know, and that that to me is like the interesting thing when we're talking about. Yeah, the sort of the yeah, the, the eco-socialist square, you know, of this book. Well, what I like is that instead of having to say eco-socialist, you just define socialist as automatically eco-socialist, which I appreciate. So, um, I guess we should probably get some questions from the audience. I feel like I've sort of talked to you long enough, Peter. So, um, if people want to come up to the front, and um, we'll take I think like a, a couple of questions at a time, and then. Um, can answer them, Peter can answer questions. And so, um, uh, if people want to come up, so there's a microphone right here. Uh, so it's commonly believed that uh, human wants are insatiable, right? So we'll, we'll always want more. And more than that, that um, our perception of want actually will turn into needs. So there's an example in Adam Smith where he refers to a cotton shirt. And that uh, a cotton shirt in his time was very recently viewed as a luxury. But at the time, it had become so humiliating to show up in public without a cotton shirt that the idea of not providing one was actually uh, a failure of the state to provide for the common welfare. So uh, I just want to address that right off the bat, that I think it's sometimes harder to make a distinction between wants and needs when you're talking about this. But how do you think we can move into a world in which humans' insatiable wants can be met? I mean, that, that's the world of post-scarcity, is that any want can be met. Uh, and do you think that is actually possible? Do you think that is something that we can do? I mean, I have a quick answer to that, which is that uh, I think wants are easily virtualized, and there are probably a lot of people in this room that are more interested in uh, maximizing their Twitter likes than their number of cotton shirts. And so the, they, this is not necessarily a big problem for me in terms of the you know, material capacity of, you know, or the ability to have a post-scarcity society. And in fact, that's part of what my chapter of com on communism is about, is the way in which the things we want are ultimately just respect from other people, not you know, shirts. The shirt, the, the cotton shirt is ultimately just about what other people think of you anyway, so, you know. Okay, sure. And also just, you know, um, the sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, the, you know, the communist manifesto nuance. That it's not just, I mean, should we think of this as human nature or as something that, you know, capitalism is producing new wants and new needs? Um, I think there's a lot of interesting questions about needs, but um, those are probably too much to get into here. Yeah, so within the like techno-optimistic kind of like left-leaning ideas that, that you guys kind of like talked about, do, I sometimes wonder like if on the political left in a world that is like super hierarchical, we're putting like the cart before the horse and are creating technologies to be used by like the powerful to enslave us rather than, than liberate us. And I wonder like when, you know, when technology and technological innovation isn't ethnic, ethically neutral, like do we fear as leftists we're inventing, you know, machines to be used by the powerful in some sort of like scary, like Wally-esque world as opposed to a, a liberatory world and if we're buying too hard into the, the kind of modern meta-narrative of technology as liberating. First of all, I thought Wally was pretty, I thought Wally seemed like a pretty dope situation. I don't know why people think it's like so bad. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, this is a thing, but this is like a thing that goes back to, and this is an old Marxist idea and something that goes back to the beginning of capitalism. It's like, there is the potential for this technology to liberate us. It does not because of the social structures in which we are embedded. So this, in that sense, I'm just doing like the oldest fucking thing in the history of the socialist movement. It's being like, look, we have all this technology and it could make life awesome, but it doesn't because of the relations of production. Yeah. You have the nice like robo bee example where there's this like this thing called the robo bee that could um, you know could be like military surveillance or it could be sort of like a you know way to um, deal with things like colony collapse. Although hopefully we could just prevent colony collapse in the first place. But um, but yeah, that, that was a good example. For like for like drone surveillance of people for like selling marijuana or something. So, oh. hi. Um, so my question was, I guess, seeing nation states as a byproduct of capitalism um, in these post-capitalist societies or these four futures, um, do you think 
that nation states will just organically disappear, or is that something that we're going to have to actively try to like dismantle um, in order for us to like have these realize this sort of like community um, planet? And if so, like how do you envision that? that we overcome these like linguistic and cultural differences because I think that brings us into like a post-colonial question of like who are we again to suggest like oh, this is the best way to live life yeah I mean there's, there's sort of two questions there about there's the question of sort of of self-determination um, of like people being able to determine for themselves their own what they think their own best way of living is there's also just the question of how nationalism and imperialism and colonialism plays into this. I mean, I was just in Britain for a book tour where obviously right-wing English nationalism is very much on the mind of everyone on the left. And I do think that is one of the ways that the, the sort of more negative aspects of what I'm writing about play out, right? You know, I write about the, you know, the, the, the rich and the capitalist class retreating into their, their private islands. And nationalism is one way where, you know, literally in the case of Britain, you say to some aspect, some segment of the working class, you can join me on the private island, even though in the long run it's not going to work out very well for them. But that is, that is one of the ways in which a, a socialist and a communist solution to these contradictions is, is impeded, which is, what, yeah, why internationalism and anti-imperialism and anti-colonialism is actually really central to this, you know. Thanks. So uh, I have a UBI question. I get a little nervous talking in front of people, so I'll try to talk slow and ask it properly. Uh, so it's, it's obviously, it's gradually starting to be kind of in the news more and more and debated. Uh, you're starting to see, somebody sent me a link this morning to a, I don't know, one of those junk business mags uh, I don't remember what it was, but it was literally it was Obama talking about you know uh, automation and his weighing in on uh, you know well we might have to take care of people with a UBI I think, you know eight years later thanks uh, so I guess the question is kind of the UBI would work I think we all agree if if output you know, continues to grow and we continue to have, you know, more and more productivity and the problem is aggregate demand not keeping up with consuming that. Um, apart, you know, I'm talking now kind of, you know what I mean, near future, not too far out. Uh, the argument, you know, that people always have against it that, and I advocate for a UBI, but this is a tough argument, they say, you introduce that now, and you're going to just create inflation because you're going to boost aggregate demand and we're not going to have the added output. And it could be, it, it could be a, a major setback almost if it's introduced too soon in the wrong kind of way and it does cause that problem. It could set us back into, you know, uh, a, a pretty bad path. So I'm sure you probably talked about this before or addressed this before and I was just curious what you would say, you know, to that argument against the UBI. All right, so like two, yeah, two things here. Uh, it, even most mainstream economists at this point acknowledge that the people running our economy have been desperate for more inflation for a very long time now, so this concern about inflation is insane to me. That just is not an issue. Uh, there is a political problem with the UBI, and it's also the thing that's interesting about it, which is that it has a right wing and a left wing flavor. The right wing flavor wants to liquidate a lot of the welfare state including things like education and health care that I think cannot be replaced by cash. And so when we're advocating for it, we have to be very clear about what we mean by a left-wing basic income, which is not one that replaces you know, the demand for universal health care, not one that demands the that replaces the demand for universe, you know, for education, but that does replace things like means-tested benefits and all this other crap that m subordinates people to caseworkers and so on. So we just have to be very clear about the politics of that. That, to me, is the interesting and important question about UBI, not these things about inflation, which I think are basically bullshit. Hi there. Um, first of all, thank you so much for writing um, Four Futures. Uh, it's been a big influence on my thinking and that of a lot of my friends uh, since it was an essay, and I'm really excited that it's getting a hearing. You said once in one of your theoretical blog posts something to the effect of, like, 
science fiction is to futurism what critical theory is to conspiracy theory. And the advantage of science fiction over futurism, if I'm understanding your point right, is that it gives you the ability to imagine specific forms of life within different political economies. Like, if this, then this is the kind of cultural result and so on. This is the kind of way that people live their lives in that society. So in the spirit of that, I was wondering, um, what specific institutions, like on like a kind of micro level, in terms of like agencies, organizations, forms of political organization, whatever, um, could you imagine existing in a socialist society that would actually make it possible? So you mentioned basic income as like a main argument in Four Futures, but what specific sort of institutions would exist in that kind of society that are kind of hard for us to imagine right now that would help make it work? And I guess my second question would be, to what extent can we bring those kinds of institutions about in the here and now, rather than waiting for some total transformation of society? That's a hard one. Um, uh, yeah, you brought up my sort of my thing about how you know I yeah I I don't I'm not a futurist. I don't you know Marx has a great line about not writing recipes for the kitchens of the future. But I try not to do that. I try to maybe describe what the kitchen looks like, kinda, and maybe what the ingredients are there, but not necessarily what you're going to cook. Um, and in terms of institutions, right, in some ways, the kind of thought of experiment of this book is like the communist sort of dream is like there aren't institutions except for the voluntary ones that people produce. Because in a situation without scarcity, you don't need states to manage it. You don't need authoritarian regimes to manage like who gets what, right? I use the example, so I didn't get into this that much, but like I use you know examples from science fiction a lot in the book to illustrate things. And in the chapter about communism, I talk about you know a book by Cory Doctorow, the American uh, scientist fiction author where he talks about uh, he basically sets it in a post scarcity society where a bunch of people get together and run Disneyland because in a communist society that's just what you do if you feel like it if you don't feel like it then you go do something else right institutions are ad hoc they arise as necessary you know from each according to her ability to each according to her need right and it's only right and so when I bring in the ecological question and bring, bring in questions of scarcity that's when you need institutions that's when you need ways of organizing how society is going to run and who gets what but the the sort of dream is that you don't need that that to me is right it's like the end point of Marxism and anarchism are the same ultimately that all organization is voluntary it's just that in practice, that's, you know, we don't, we, we don't live that way, but that's, that's sort of the long run vision. So Peter, uh, you alluded to earlier uh, about the fact that there would be some facets of, I suppose for lack of a better word, the human that may not be able to be replicable by automation or that wouldn't be able to be phased out or replaced by automation. So do you think you could be able to name a few examples of what these may be and why. There's only one that I, well, there's two. One is the simple coordinating function of if you have machines to do everything, someone has to sort of determine what machines are allowed to exist and what they do. Otherwise, you're like in the matrix and you, the machines run you rather than the opposite. The other one is the, is the reproductive function and the, ra the raising of children, not the physical reproductive children, but the actual raising of children. Because so, so care work, la care work. Care work, but, a very, but, not, but a very specific aspect of it, which is the actual how do you like, reproduce human beings. Socialization. Right, socialization, Rick, yeah, actually like that's something that even if you, I mean, I don't think it's in principle impossible to automate that. It's just not clear that you would want to. Assuming we're not living in a world where everyone is immortal and therefore you don't need to reproduce. But assuming you want to raise new humans, you probably want you, pr you probably want to have some kind of human deliberation about how those humans are formed socially. Why? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. <laughs> uh, because otherwise, what? Because again, it's the sort of the machines dominating you scenario. What kind of people are these that are raised by machines rather than by humans? Well, what do you, if you trust program the, the machines to? Socialize? Right. Do you trust the machines to raise them? And I don't know. And, and again, I'm in, I I'm not. I'm you know. And I'm I'm sort of I'm, I'm agnostic about this question. Again, if we get to a situation where we're all immortal and we don't need to reproduce, then maybe this just becomes not an issue. But in the situation in which you have you know, immature humans that need to be socialized in some way. That might be, that might be a context in which there's, there's some human labor that has to be thought about and organized in some way. But again, I mean, I, 
I sort of try to encourage the thought experiment with this book and in general of like, if you think it can't be automated, it probably can. Whether it should be is another question, but it probably can be. So uh, Stephen Hawking recently has created some headline buzz when he uh, announced, just to compress and simplify, that the big thing to worry about was not that robots will become intelligent and when they do, they'll kill us, um, but that um, we will have this technology that makes abundance possible, but if it's controlled by the 0.001 percent, that we will still have masses condemned to uh, you know, lives of misery and starvation. Um, he's not known as particularly a leftist, and I don't know whether he's said enough or if he read enough about what he has said to comment, but I'm curious um, if you can speak to it, what you think he gets and what you think he doesn't. I mean, I think in some sense that he's, he's essentially describing what I'm talking about in the book. It's, it's that, you know, the, that situation in which there is, there's labor-saving technology and there's either some level of abundance or some level of scarcity is the bottom half of my diagram. That's what happens in a class society, either exterminism or rentism, depending on whether you get the more, you know, genocidal or just the more absurd version of it. I, that he doesn't put it explicitly, explicitly in terms of, uh, you know, this is why we need to win the class wars because he's not a revolutionary socialist, but that's, that, that's where I would differ with him, I guess. But in terms of the, otherwise, the analysis, I think, is quite similar. Hey, yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk. I loved the original article in Jacobin, so I'm excited it's in book form now. Uh, it's a really interesting read. Um, my question is, you write a lot about universal basic income on your blog and about a lot of the benefits of it. Uh, the context that I've seen UBI discussed is sort of in the context of one of three sort of possible solutions to sort of move beyond capitalism modify capitalism. Uh, it's either that, it's the uh, you know, reduced work week, reduced hours, or the uh, universal job uh, guarantee. Uh, you obviously favor, you favor UBI for a lot of reasons, but if this isn't too complex of a question, I'm just sort of wondering, is there a combination of those that's ideal you know, politically or uh, towards you know, getting us to the one of the four futures that we want to be at? Or that, uh, is there one of these solutions that's, that's better than the others for whatever reason? Basic income should be paired with shorter work weeks and a higher minimum wage, all of which disincentivize the use of human labor in production, which is what I'm interested in. The only thing I'm not interested in is things like the job guarantee, which, incent which basically create a political logic where you can create bullshit jobs for people to do, even when they're not necessary, where the point is that people should be spending less time in wage labor. I I agree that like, we should be think, talking about basic income in combination with things like shorter hours and higher wages because all of those things push in the direction of less wage labor. The only thing that I sort of want to kick out of the boat here is the job guarantee crap. And I think this is going to be the last question, so. Uh, hi there, no thank you uh, for a very interesting talk. Maybe a question for both of you. Um, I've been thinking a bit recently about uh, the American coal miner as a place where questions about the environmental left and the traditional socialist left interact in quite interesting ways. You know, communities, working class communities successfully unionized, good jobs, and now the environmental movement essentially wants to destroy their industry, which makes climate denial arguably economically rational for them. So curious if you have any thoughts on, on that area of work and environment. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's just an extreme example of the way in which I think so socialist politics is about, to me, the liberation of the working class, meaning the liberation of the working class from being a working class. And that's specifically, the, in the case of things that are immediately destructive, like coal mining, yes, it has an immediate valence of like what, how do people, what do we do for people that are displaced by immediately necessary political changes. But in general, you know, yeah, I'm for the abolition of wage labor. Uh, so, and again, like if you take the sort of premise of my book and all of that shit, it's saying, look, if we can automate everything, the question is how do we transition? How do we take, how do we take the abundance that is possible and share it with the people that are currently trapped in wage labor. And in some ways, the, yeah, the coal miner is only a more extreme example of a more general question. And that, like, yeah, that 
yeah, I, liberation and emancipation, not the sort of veneration or romanticization of the kinds of jobs that people happen to be trapped in. Yeah, I mean, I think to that too, on the, it seems like whether or not there's like a climate crisis, people shouldn't have to work in coal mines and whether or not there's like a, um, people are, uh, there's full automation, you know, if we automate the coal mine, and if there's a climate crisis, we don't want to be, you know, automated coal. So, I mean, I think there's, it, it's a way, it, it often pose counterparts, but I think, you know, I do, I do think um, there's a, I mean, I agree with, with Peter and all of this, and I think that it's an extreme example of, like, yeah, some jobs should definitely be killed. So, um, okay. So I guess that's uh, on that note. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll be around and Peter will yeah, be around. Thanks, to everybody. Ask your questions and um, enjoy. Yeah, thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks, Alyssa, for doing this. Uh, we'll be hanging out.